You're listening to The Real Well Show with Kathy Fetke, the real estate investor's resource. Have you been wanting to get into commercial real estate and maybe thinking now is the time with so much distress? I'm Kathy Fetke and welcome to The Real Well Show. Well, you're in luck. Our guest today is a commercial real estate expert. Ben Lapidus was recently a partner and chief financial officer for the Spartan Investment Group, where he applied his acquisitions, capital markets, corporate finance, accounting, and data engineering skills to construct from scratch a self-storage portfolio of over $500 million in assets under management. Ben is also the founder and host of the Best Ever Real Estate Investing Conference, now on its eighth year in April. And Ben is here with us today to tell us what he sees on the horizon for commercial real estate. Ben, welcome to The Real Well Show. Kathy, thanks for having me. It's so fun to have you here on this platform because I have been on your platform for right, how many years? How many years have you been putting on the uh, Best Ever Conference? Seven years. Seven? That you've been, yeah, you've been coming to the best ever conference. Yeah. Yeah. I think I've spoken at every single one too. And yes, possibly that's right. Yeah. I, I didn't realize that. I, I think there's only like three or four people that have spoken at like every single one. I didn't realize that. Yeah. Yeah. This might be the year my uh, track record ends, but I think I was on stage for every single one of them. And it's exciting to watch how that's grown. Yeah, it, it's it's uh, it's grown from 150 people the first time you spoke to uh, over thousands knocking on the door of 1,500 people now. Yeah, representing and a pretty cool audience. Even though we put on events, I will I will say yours truly is uh, best ever because it's so it's um, your event is really more commercial real estate based and uh, very very high level, super sophisticated. Like if you want to take your real estate to the next level, this is the place. I think, um, you know, people should check it out. Is there still room to buy tickets? There is still room to buy tickets. We're, we're down to the last hundred for, for this venue for this year. But um, yeah, it's, it's a trade event. I think that's why people like it. We, we don't have anything to sell. It's really a homecoming for the industry where people can get updated on what's new for the space and they can foster new relationships or have keep, keep going with their old relationships. It's, it's the one place to meet everyone from the industry uh, every and your, year. And your partner on that is Joe Fairless? It is. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So in 2016. Yeah. It's, it's been really cool to watch you guys soar. I know um, Joe came to me when he was first starting out and asked me, you know, if I would give him any help or input on how to do a podcast (laughs) and look at him now. (laughs) Gosh, how long ago was that? (laughs) I don't know. A long time ago. It was when he was first starting and, and, and he was just considering uh, investing in apartments and boy, did he time that well. Yes, you did. Yeah. <laughs> so you um, you didn't go that route. Uh, you chose storage. Um, why? Yeah, I, I think I was looking at multifamily and thinking, um, you know, I don't know how much this leans into my particular skill sets. Multifamily is very operationally heavy. Uh, there's a lot of maintenance. There's a lot of management. Um, there's a lot of livelihood uh, for people and, and where they live. Um, and so I, I wanted to lean into something a bit less consumer and a bit more business ish. So I could be, I could, I could truly unleash my, um, my, my, uh, my ruthless capitalist without feeling like I'm involving myself in people's livelihoods. So storage was just the right intersection of easy to manage, easy to maintain, easy to monetize with evictions. Um, and it, it played out very, very well. We built a, an incredible half a billion dollar portfolio at Spartan. Yeah. Yeah. You guys, I, I watched you kind of take off and it's been, it's been incredible to, to see how that's gone. I have never really thought of it that way. I mean, I remember many, many years ago when I, I was dating, I had a boyfriend whose family didn't want to do multifamily. They only wanted to do commercial space. And I think, uh, you know, it's like downtown, not downtown Oakland, but in Oakland on College Avenue, they own a lot of the buildings that have restaurants and offices and retail and so forth. And, um, you know, they just didn't, they just thought it was less wear and tear because like you said, there's families, they're there 24 hours with offices. It's usually, you know, eight to 10 hours a day, right? A little bit less wear and tear, but I had never thought about the difference between evicting a business and a family. You know, like, is that what you meant when you said it? I think so. Yeah. I, I, I I've owned multifamily. I've owned single family. I've flipped houses. I've, you know, I've, I've done, I've done the gamut of what, what, what uh, gets talked about on bigger pockets. 
And sometimes it worked out really great and it was mutually beneficial for everyone. And sometimes there was a choice between maximizing your return for your family and um, feeling like you were supporting the people that you were in partnership with in this house, which are your tenants. And, and, and not every time do those incentives kind of come together. Um, and without saying anything about the industry or the space or, or certain individuals, it just it felt better to me to uh, maximize my ruthlessness in a business setting as opposed <laughs> to uh, with, with, with individuals and families. Yeah, that's really interesting. When in 2009, when the foreclosure crisis happened, I had gone to a lot of foreclosure classes before that. And I'd heard how people kind of go in and negotiate in pre foreclosure. And back then it was not in the favor of the homeowner, the person losing their house. It was really, like you said, ruthless investors just trying to get to maximize their return at the expense of a family, you know, who was in foreclosure. And I, I was disgusted by that. And then when the foreclosure crisis happened and we were dealing with banks, it's kind of a different story. Like, well, I'm not too worried about them. I'm going to, I'm going to be ruthless yeah. in my negotiation now because it's just a bank. Anyway. Yeah. I, I kind of see your point there. Yeah. Uh, and, and, it, and it's been, it's been uh, really fun to watch this industry mature. Multifamily has just been kind of a, uh, one of the major uh, four horsemen of commercial real estate for decades and storage has been the redheaded stepchild. And I think in that perception, there has been opportunity. And so we've been able to ride the wave of institutionalization as it's gone from a, you know, semi mom and pop to a fully fledged, you know, reach structured asset class. Well, my husband, as you know, who is a redhead would say, well, that means it's a great asset class. If it's That's the, right. That's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> the best one out there. Uh, okay. Um, so w you and I at what at best ever, I was always so lucky to get on economic panels with really top level people like John Chang. I think he's speaking this year. Is he doing a keynote keynote this year? He's not doing a keynote this year, but he is putting on a workshop for half a day. It's our Ooh. first year doing uh, additional content for those that are looking for the how to. So John Chang is doing his uh, workshop on how to identify opportunities with a macro thesis. So like how, how do you develop a macro thesis about where and what asset class to invest in? And then how do you execute that by finding the right opportunities inside those, those macro, um, uh, or sorry, those, those micropolitan statistical areas. So uh, I'm really excited to watch him do that. He is one of two workshops this year, the other one being CRE models, and they're doing a workshop on underwriting and uh, executing your, your deal thesis, your investment thesis, excuse me, um, from the perspective of the, the finances, whereas John's really focused on, on the economics and, and the markets. Um, and then he is, yeah, he's, he's going to be participating in our intellectual debate. Uh, do you know David Rosenberg? We also have him this year. He is a Canadian economist. Um, I think more, more labor and, and, and financial economist, but i um, excited to have his perspective on this year's stage as well. Yeah, no, I love the way that you're very creative and the way you set these sessions up. Like, for example, the debate. Uh, I've been lucky enough to be a part of the debate several years. And um, and you would kind of basically assign us topics that we either agreed with or not. We didn't we didn't really know what we were getting. And we had yeah. to debate that side. And <laughs> it's really fun. I think I won both times with I got to have John Chang as my partner. So that helped. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, he, he lost last year. So. <laughs> we did. No, no, no. John, John Chang lost. Last oh, year. he lost last year, but the year we were together, we won. <laughs> sometimes it's, sometimes it's very intellectual and sometimes it's very, uh, emotional and I'm just going to sling, you know, uh, as Neil Bawa puts it, poo poo to the other side, but it's always fun regardless. So. It's, it's so fun. Yeah. So people kind of in the audience get to state their opinion. And if their opinion changed by the end of the debate, that means that kind of shows who won. And mm -hmm. I think the year that I was up there with John, uh, we had the biggest sway of opinion um, ever at best ever. Right. Yeah. Like over 30 <laughs> point swing, I, I think. Right. <laughs> yeah. It was great. It was great. If we could just do this in politics, wouldn't that be interesting? <laughs> Our... <laughs> we won't, we won't go there. Okay. So given that you have so much exposure, uh, you're always a part of that debate. Where are you with the economy? It's, it's very confusing times. It's like the Fed has been trying to slow down the economy and it just keeps picking up. We, I mean, obviously inflation's come down, but it went up a little bit last month. But the job market is still strong. There's not as much concern about a recession, but then you get these big fund managers from New York saying, oh, no, 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 it's going to be the worst one ever coming. You know, so where are you 
um, let's say just for 2024 and 2025 in terms of recession in the U.S.? Yeah, so I I I think a soft landing has already been achieved personally, um, but the important starting point I think on that on that topic, at least from from my perspective, is identifying the fact that we're really talking about a tale of two economies. There is more wealth in, uh, inequality than there has ever has been. So what affects the bottom ninety percent doesn't affect the top one percent, and I think the top ten percent of America owns like 92% of the stock market, something like that. So when we're talking about injecting assets into the ecosystem, however many years ago, and that's just increasing the balance sheets of the wealthy and then shifting interest rates, which just makes assets less accessible to those who don't have wealth. It's there, There's different deployments of strategies that affect two different groups of people in a way that is less uh, overlapped than it used to be in the past. So when, when I think about the real estate market, which is generally more held by um, those who already have wealth, I don't see a massive swing occurring because there isn't a systemic issue in the banks around their collateralization of the, the assets and around the shops that have these assets on their balance sheets. There are There's definitely distress. There's definitely some syndication groups, probably, that have um, perhaps not enough cash to weather the storm. But that's going to be, I think, fewer and farther between. Uh, and I, and I, I see the, con- the, con- the conversations occurring between the debt and the equity side being so much more collaborative this time around uh, than 12, 13 years ago. So um, I, I see commercial real estate as honestly too safe of an investment class right now because we're not going to be experiencing the growth with it, the growth in rates, the growth in occupancy. Um, so we're probably not going to get a huge cash flow push. Um, but there's still a lot of demand from the institutions to invest in the right commercial real estate asset classes. So I think that the the, the pricing will stay stable and not and honestly just not be attractive enough. That's my personal take. But I probably shouldn't adulterate it for anybody who wants to come to the best ever conference this year because the motion is will commercial real estate uh, returns uh, go back to the peaks of the last economic cycle. So <laughs> that is going to be the debate question for this year. Yeah, well, I mean, there's so much money on the sideline waiting, waiting for good deals to show up. And I don't know. I mean, what do you, are you seeing any out there? Uh, you know, I, I've kind of taken my eye off the ball a little bit these last few months, but um, in in the storage space, not a ton. I mean, you have to get incredibly creative. It's It's kind of back to basics. The uh, ride the wave era is over. The buy everything era is over. And now you really have to be particular about your deals. And it, it, we're kind of back to a place where um, I think we should be more judgmental of the velocity of capital deployment. And by that, I mean, if you see a group doing you know, uh, 50 different multifamily deals at the same time, kind of have to question, like, how are they identifying that much creative opportunity that the market isn't seeing? Um, you know, what what's their secret sauce? Because dialing for dollars at scale just doesn't work. So, um, yeah, that that would be my my concern today. Like there are deals to be had. Don't get me wrong. Like you can you can find great deals with great IRR, even some with great cash flow, which is harder to find. But when you see it being done at um, at velocity, like a, like an, an intense velocity where hundreds of millions of dollars are being raised at the same time for active deals, uh, I get a little bit more dubious that um, that there is uh, creativity being injected into those deals, and it's not just a fee play. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Okay, for us simple people in residential, and I say that with all the love to my listeners who are not into commercial real estate and maybe don't understand a word you just said. So in, in residential, uh, what do you see there? We're, we're mostly one to four unit housing uh, would be my audience and what we do at Real Wealth. We also, as you know, have a single family rental fund. We just closed that out and we're still building homes uh, where there's great need. But what are you, you know, what are your thoughts on the residential side? Yeah, I, I think I think residential still has a lot of the strong fundamentals. As long as you can identify the right markets with the growth patterns, I think that there's enough migration and population growth and income growth happening that we need more housing, regardless. So um, it's it's all market specific, neighborhood specific, but um, there are deals to be had in BTR. There are deals to be had in single family. Uh, I'm in the process right now of selling the vast majority of my single family portfolio, but that's because. I have uh, I, I bought them all at the beginning of the last cycle. And so my return on equity is so low at this point. And you might say, well, why don't you refinance? And my, my reason for that is 
the interest rates are, are too high. I'd rather kind of take the cash today, wait for rates to come down and then redeploy uh, and have the optionality on where that is and not have them stuck in this particular market. Um, but single family still deals to be had. Uh, I personally believe that there are better yields in commercial real estate in general, uh, but single family, especially when you're talking about developing homes, uh, developing new places to live, I think there's incredible opportunity in the BTR space. And BTR is billed to rent uh, for anyone who's not not sure about that. Uh, okay, how about like what are you seeing since you have connections with so many people? Uh, what kind of distress are you seeing with some of these new syndicators that came out and did the bridge debt and you know we're paying double the price of a multifamily than the than the year prior? Um, what what, do you, what kind of um, wreckage are you seeing out there right now? Yeah. So I, I don't have statistics. I, I'm not in a vantage point where I, I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm an owner of, uh, of, uh, of one of these data companies and I can, I can, I can provide statistics, but the stories that I've heard, which I've heard, I don't know, a few dozen stories, there's definitely interest rate distress. Uh, that's there for sure. And so companies that have variable rate loans on their portfolios are paying more in debt service than they anticipated and putting themselves outside of their debt service covenants where there's not enough cash flow to cover the debt service multiple uh, such that they're in technical default. But I'm also seeing a lot of collaboration with banks when they're in that arena, as long as they are in a place that they can survive despite being outside of their debt service covenants. What I'm seeing in multifamily almost even more so than in the interest rate distress is the un inability to achieve the underwritten rental rate increases. So you've got folks buying at the end of 2021, beginning of 2022, assuming a 30, 40, 50% rental rate increase over a two, three, four year period, because they're going to do some lipstick renovations on these turns. And it's just not there. We're seeing incremental rates having dropped over the last year. Maybe revenue is going up, or flat, but incremental rates have dropped by 40%. So if your play, uh, at one point it was 40%. If your play is to swap out all of your tenants, do a lipstick renovation, and then put new tenants in there at a 20, 30% increase of the last rent, that's just not being achieved. And you're going to have to wait another three or four years. And that's the trouble. Folks are not able to hit their cash flow because the revenue is just not on track with the underwriting more so even than the interest rates or the debt service, excuse me, being more expensive than anticipated on those variable rate loans. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, to bottom line that uh, we've got a lot of people in trouble because they can't make their payments. We had a lot of ambitious uh, yeah, revenue underwriting, a lot of ambitious revenue growth patterns that are not being realized and now they can't make their debt payments. You got it. Yeah. 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 So um, that's a tough place to be in, but it is what it is. These were some pretty dramatic increases in, in rates. Okay. So uh, we only have a few minutes left, but I, I want to bring up something that isn't, isn't talked about very much, especially in the world that you're in, which is commercial real estate, which is kind of dog eat dog. I mean, it's very competitive. Uh, people work long, hard hours. And yet, you know, there's, there's life and family and marriage and children. How do you balance it? How do you balance scaling a business, scaling your real estate portfolio and, and remembering what matters most? Yeah, I, I, um, I'll be honest, I, I spent a large part of my adult life so far not being very good at that. Um, I think it kind of starts with determining your own boundaries, determining what's the right answer for you um, and being particular about the circumstances that you put yourself in to maintain those boundaries successfully. So um, I, for, for me, it starts with a conversation with my partner, my wife. And saying, well, what are what are we seeking? What is our mission statement? What is our strategic vision for our family? And what how are we looking to behave with each other on our own with the rest of the world in achieving that? What are our boundaries in, in, in getting there? What is our value system? And then identifying the right complements to that in the business world is the next step. Uh, and that's something that I am I'm kind of always iterating on and just always looking to prune my relationships such that I am being authentic with who I want to be um, and growing in the direction that I want to grow uh, and still maintaining commercial viability. And I there's this concept in Japanese culture called Ikigai. And Ikigai is at the intersection. Have you heard of this before? I don't want to. Mm -mm, no. Okay. Ikigai is at the intersection of four different pursuits of your life, something that is economically viable that you can make a, a buttload of money with, something that you're great at, that you have a, 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 an organic skill set to do, something that you enjoy, that's usually referred to as passion, and then something that the world needs. 
And so I, I, I think that that passion and that um, uh, can only really be achieved in the long run if you feel committed to your setup, which is your work life balance. Um, so I, I, I have a, a system where I only kind of work with, not only, I shouldn't say only, I tend to work with a lot of moms because I know intimately, um, you know, well, I actually don't know intimately because I haven't been a mom, but I have watched my wife go through motherhood and I have watched the difficulties of others, uh, trying to maintain a work-life balance. And I, I appreciate, uh, putting, putting your kids first. Um, I, I believe in that. And so I like to work with other folks who also put their kids first uh, above their work, not to say that they shouldn't sacrifice, not to say that they shouldn't make hard decisions and, and be in business places on the holidays. But it's it's there's, there's got to be buy in for that. You have to be able to bring your whole self to a project. Otherwise, you're not going to you're not going to sustain that passion. Well, I can tell you as a mother who has two grown children, that is worth it. You know, it's, it's worth it. And I, I watched over the years, my kids come to me for everything and anything, and even tell their friends they were busy when they just wanted to really hang out with mom. Uh -huh. um, oh, I know they're just, they're just the best. And, and, and they would tell me that their friends, they didn't have a single friend who wanted to hang out with their parents. And yet my kids are always hanging out with us. I'm, I swear, like they would not go to parties because they just wanted to be home with us sometimes. Yeah, and cool people. <laughs> you spend your time doing cool things. So I get, I want to hang out with you just for fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you can't just be sitting around. Like we would definitely take them to do really fun and cool things so that it would be a, a better choice for them. But, um, but now that they're grown up and we are like best friends, and, you know, we were still, Rich and I were still able to scale a business, but not massively. We don't have a billion dollar portfolio like so many people are proud of. I'd love to say that we do, but, you know, we don't because our attention was else, elsewhere, but we have enough and we're happy. So it's, it's worth it. That's all I can say. Like what you just said, know what your family really wants in the end and let that be the focus. Well, if, if you don't mind my saying so, and, uh, and, and taking the last 30 seconds, I, I, I have, uh, peeked into the window of your life and how you are living. And I have also peeked into the window of other people's lives that, that do have a billion assets under management. And I would say that you have done an excellent job at living, which I think is the point. So I, I, I don't think that having a billion dollar portfolio, I mean, a lot of people have 1% of a billion dollar portfolio, call it a billion dollar portfolio. Whereas you guys have really built a successful business. It's all your own uh, that doesn't have the same kind of vanity metrics. Yet when I look at how you've chosen to live your life, you and Rich, compared to others, I, I, I look up to the two of you as like my life goals, hashtag life goals, you know? Uh, not that means a lot. That means a lot coming from you. All right, Ben. Well, I will uh, be in Salt Lake City during your event. I can't wait to swing by and see you all and give you a big hug. It's a great event. I hope to see some of you there too. Um, so if you would just give some details on where people can find out more about the best ever conference. Yeah. Check out besteverconference.com and we're innovating this year. We are uh, launching next week, our best ever deal directory. So, uh, dozens of sponsors are going to have all of their deals available to review all their offering materials in advance and schedule appointments with them. So if you are a passive investor looking to connect with other types of syndicators, we've got the program for you. No additional cost. Looking forward to meeting you there. Awesome. All right, Ben. Great to see you and we'll see you soon. All right. Thanks, Kathy. And thank you for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. You can go to realwealthshow.com to find out how you can build your single family rental portfolio. Again, realwealthshow.com. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any securities or to make or consider any investment or course of action. For more information, go to realwealthshow.com.